you bleeding out of your ears and eyes that we might get worried. Well, a little bit of bleeding out of the ears is okay. It's it's when it's it's a lot when it's pronounced. Yeah, like a regular dream. Well, I know that there's one other thing that uh, I think we talked about last time, but it's getting to be a problem in my household is that I need a haircut. I mean, as you know, um, you experience the same problems. Uh, yeah, to a certain extent. <laughs> Although, I think I need to cut down the reflectivity here. Yeah. <laughs> See. Well, have your have your makeup person come in. We can wait here for a minute. Yeah, come in. Yeah. Out, a little, out uh, of the forehead. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Well, hey, uh, so for those folks that are just joining, so we are live. We're going to have other folks that are jumping in here shortly. Uh, a few other familiar faces coming in. Um, th this is just a standard, you know, ask me anything AMA format. So uh, we've got the session that's going over on uh, Zoom as well as a live stream on Facebook. And I'll just get this question out of the way for anybody that watches the recording and wonders, like, you're talking about Microsoft products and services and answering questions, and yet you're leveraging both Zoom and Facebook. Why? <laughs> and uh, that's a great question. If we were doing a webinar or this was kind of closed, like specifically focused to, towards the community, we would use nothing but the Microsoft technologies for those things. But we're trying to reach the broadest audience possible and where's the, the community race on, on Facebook. And we want the, to allow anybody to join in, hence the, the zoom. So, um, only makes yeah. sense. And I will, uh, I will promote Laura's joining us here. Um, uh -oh. so, you know, anybody feel free to ask questions. We're going to chat it up. We'll go through some open questions, questions that we're hearing. I'm sure Laura's got a few things to add in. Uh, questions that she's hearing from clients that we can discuss. She might. Hey, I don't know if you heard, I'll get this out. Uh, Microsoft has announced that if you, due to the way things are running right now, if you are trying to bring, uh, bring people up on teams, it may not happen right away. There's a full 24 hours that it may take to actually get users provisioned at this point. Oh, really? uh, that notice. Yeah. That notice has been put, uh, I think in in the management console in admin windows and whatnot. Well, so. well when they announced I, I, this was last week, they said that they saw like a seven hundred and fifty percent increase in Teams usage, and it was already yeah. up. You know, and so they went in. If you if you don't know this, uh, uh, folks watching in, that they started throttling some services. So the uh, you know, like maybe you don't have 4K video coming through anymore or... And maybe that's uh, a benefit. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, you know, increase the, uh, to, to, to keep the system performing while this increase in traffic. And so they're going to reduce a few feet. So it's, it's actually, it's not, uh, it's not crazy to think that they might um, throttle new people joining the system and take a, a little longer for them to be added on. So... Yeah, just provisioning exercises. It's it's much like SharePoint Online, various uh, functionality. Actually, I, for folks who aren't aware of this, when you provision folks um, with OneDrive, which technically is a MySite provisioning process for those of us who remember MySites, um, there's actually a queue for everyone in the tenant that when somebody goes to initiate it, if it's self-initiated, like you try to hit your OneDrive site and it has not been provisioned for you yet, but yet your admin has set it up so that you can, can provision. You get thrown in the queue behind everybody else and you get processed through. That's why it doesn't happen instantaneously. It was never an instantaneous process, but it takes a little bit of time um, with that queuing. So. That's yep. why it may take a while. And that's why for those of you who are admins who might be thinking about rolling out OneDrive to your users, that's why they recommend you pre-provision uh, OneDrive slash my sites, set up like a PowerShell script for users who are going to be onboarding with the service so that that service, you know, the OneDrive is available to them when you're actually needed, when it's needed. A little bit of color commentary there. And, and Laura almost joined us. I saw that just for a split second was there and then not there. And yeah, I don't know. It's always something. I'll be, hold on. 
I'll figure it out. <laughs> well, this is her first time doing the video thing, so. Yeah, it's Never. tricky. It's tricky. She's not used to being on camera. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, tricky, it's difficult tricky. for some people. Yeah. It's, it's Can you go I'm run shy. DMC on us? Yeah. Run DMC? Yeah. yeah. I, I got the reference. Tricky to rock a ride. Okay. No, sing more, Sean. Yeah, uh, definitely. I will spare everyone. So I've got the, uh, so this is a, it's live streaming over on Facebook. I've got it uh, doing a watch party over in the Office 365 uh, community page. And uh, so uh, feel free to anybody ask some questions if you got them. If you're joining, um, uh, and uh, get Greg over here as well. So um, yeah, if there are, you can use the Q&A module here. You can post a question to chat. And Dr. McMurray. You're on oh, mute. No sound. He's muted. Got mute, I'll, un I'll unmute him. Unmute him. Yeah. There we go. There we go. See, there we go. That in the office. You see that background switch that fast? Yes, that is that is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> you another have to... Mick. We have another yeah. Mick. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. Well, anybody want me to go see if Stanley's busy? I can maybe see if he can join. He's 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 sleeping right now. He's doing his crossword puzzle. So yeah, well, I'll leave him be for the morning then. Yeah. So uh, I I guess we we'll, as we do we tend to do start out if there are any pressing questions you guys have seen from the community uh, over the last couple of days. Hmm. Over the last couple of days, not too many people posting questions on the weekend, but. Well, we this has been a week officially, John, since we last met. So last well, week, yeah, I'll, I'll throw one out. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a little bit of confusion on when people should use a Teams live meeting versus just a Teams meeting. So uh, just kind of opening that up to some people. What, what do you both think? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. In uh, as I just before you joined, I was. Uh, uh, stopping all the haters that are asking why you're using zoom and and uh, live streaming on facebook and my answer was we go where the people are we you know to broadcast in those locations and it's you know teams is an enterprise technology but it, it really kind of comes down to my philosophy of this is you know how interactive you want the that content to be like we did here so greg is the president of the was the president of the sharepoint user group and uh, he shirked those responsibilities off doing some like new job, oh, blah, blah, blah. Man, here less than five minutes and you're thrown in front of a bus, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I joined, you know. Christian put something on my calendar. I'm like, oh, hey, this would be cool. I can go yeah. hang out with my yeah. friends. No, it never is. It never is cool, Greg. No, uh, and, and then, uh, no, so we, we had so this conversation about like our last user group, um, and so we had, you know, guest speaker and it was more of that broadcast model. So we used the, uh, the live meeting. Uh, so that's that presentation only. You can have up to 15 co-presenters or 14 co-presenters of the one presenter. Um, so being interactive and everybody else, and there's that slight delay. It's about a 30 second delay for the broadcast. So we can do the translation transcription and uh, closed caption and other things there. Um, but that's if you have, it really comes down to the, the interactive model where you can have, uh, uh, you know, 250 people in that room and everybody interacting chat, people can speak up. So you have the ability to talk, to have your voice heard. Um, or in the live meeting, you can have up to 10,000 people that join in, um, but it's a more controlled broadcast uh, method. So if you're doing a webinar and you don't want anybody to be able to jump in and just answer questions, that's when you use the live. But if you want that interaction, do it as a meeting. And the other, the other benefit, of course, of the live meeting with the broadcast is that you can then promote that out to let anybody go in and watch that. Whereas with the, uh, the regular Teams meetings, you generally know who people are, so you're not just letting anonymous uh, you know, actors into the mix. Always a dangerous move. Yeah. Anything you would add there, Greg? Well, I was just kind of thinking about how, you know, this all plays together with, you know, people trying to connect, um, especially outside of organizations. Like, teams work so well inside of organizations. 
Um, but Usually, we all, you yeah. know, we've all experienced some of the fun with the cross tenant uh, joys, um, as well as you know the guest accounts coming in. Um, you know, it, it leaves a little bit to be desired there. The Zoom and bombing. So I just wanted to kind of throw into the mix also, you know, Microsoft's announcement where uh, they're bringing Teams more front and center with the Microsoft 365, the home use stuff that they uh, started talking about and kind of felt like that was a strange announcement, like, hey, here's what we're going to do, and it's coming later this year. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I'm not a fan of that, that style. It, it's... Um... To, to talk about uh, something well in advance because Microsoft, they improved on that. Um, uh, the last couple of years, I'm going to promote Laura back in. She left, she came back. Um, time's a charm. Uh, but the, uh, hang on, let me make sure that that stuck. There we go. Um, yeah, they, Microsoft used to do that. Talk about the roadmap, talk about things that are coming. And this is back with the, the, the old model of releasing, uh, you know, software every, uh, you know, three, four years. Uh, and they would tell, talk about things well in advance and it'd take a while to get there. And people hated that. And part of the move to the evergreen model was this, you know, we're going to talk about things not until they're, you know, in the roadmap, they're baked. Uh, and so now that we've, my personal feeling that we've now kind of adjusted to the evergreen model, even if they're talking about things that are coming in, three to six months. I, I almost feel like there's so much that is being released on a weekly and monthly basis, sometimes a yeah. couple times a week. Like, don't tell us about something three to six months out. It gets lost. We forget about it. Suddenly it appears. There's all these, these questions, Laura. you know, and just, uh, and there's Laura. Oh, yeah. And especially for, uh, yeah, the, the other software for the green screen thing wouldn't work. So I even rebooted. That's what I was doing. Anyway. Oh, no bag of tricks today, huh? Yeah. Well, it's still a good green screen, Laura. <laughs> it is a green screen. It's very green. <laughs> it is a green screen. It is a good green screen. Yeah. But, Sorry uh, anyway. to interrupt. Yeah. All right. So you're the pace of, uh, well, you did. <sighs> you're welcome to interrupt, Laura. He's this merciless. Is I'm going to uh, I'm going to go back to my I, I think this is the most successful background last week. Where is it? Did I delete it? Oh no! Oh no! There it is. Back background trip Here again. We go. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, look at that, Christian. You're you're fancy. <laughs> I'm helping Charlotte with her homework. Hello, Hello Charlotte. Charlotte. Charlotte, is your mom making you do her work? <laughs> <laughs> We're doing algebra and. Oh. Well, right now we're doing multimedia. In multi yeah. she's, she's a multimedia class, so oh, clearly awesome. we're doing hey, there you I said, go. Charlotte, you're the only kid in the school, I'm pretty sure, that has a green screen at their house. Like, we've got to do something with a green screen for your multimedia homework. <laughs> Definitely. So, I've been seriously right. considering uh, permanently putting – oh, I can't see it now because I've, I've changed things, but – um, so I've got these double closet doors behind me of, of just doing like a curtain across the top to make it look like a big window, but doing a curtain out of the green screen material. Uh, Good idea. It's a lot oh, well, it can't have wrinkles in it. So yeah, I've got this big totally flat, flat thing that you like expand out. Like, you know, those umbrella, the things that you like pop open. It's yep. like that, but it's a green screen, like a portable green screen. Yeah, so as long like as you can put something, something like that, that's as long as it's a flat material, then you could, it would work because then you wouldn't see the wrinkles in it. Yeah. That's a lot of effort. I know. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, any other questions? So, so Greg, any, any other comments on that? Any other well, just the last thing to kind of bring it all together is uh, just around that announcement, you know, enterprises appreciate having some heads up, you know, it helps with their planning and just how it generally functions. Um, it just felt a little funny from the consumer side you know, consumers don't have those same concerns. And, you know, quite frankly, they've kind of gotten used to this, you know, I'm getting constant updates to the apps on my phone sort of model. Like you're announcing it. This sounds cool. I want to use it. Oh, it's six months away. That just feels really weird from the consumer side. Yeah. yeah don't tell me about it if I can't touch it. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's uh, so with the productivity tips webinars that I do with Tom Duff. Uh, so I have a running kind of a V next deck that I pull from when I, I just have now gotten the habit where I read about stuff and 
I'd be like, hey, that's going to be really cool. Oh, not available until later this summer or something. And I'll put it in that deck with kind of a, and I'll put a reminder within my calendar to go take a look. And so I'm just, I have four or five things that I'm checking back on on a regular basis. Is like, is this even available yet? Are people still talking about it? Because it's happened where something will pop it. Suddenly it's on the system. I will have completely forgotten about this, this functionality. Um, yeah, I was, here's an example. I was pleasantly surprised with the new office app and a couple of the features that we've talked about for months, like the ability to go in and snap a photo of a table or a graph yeah. in a magazine article and OCR and pull that in. I don't know if you guys have played with that. It, yeah. And they have a signature thing in there. It's so cool. The signature thing is awesome. Awesome. So yeah. So describe but, the signature thing. Because I've not seen it. Just it just says sign a document and you click a button and then you just pick, pick which document and then you go with your finger and it's signed. It doesn't have the sound effect. I think she's embellishing. <laughs> um, but we need the Laura Rogers edition <laughs> to get the sound effect. Yeah, <laughs> that checkbox. Think about that's that's one, like, one of the most common painful things. It like is. Uh, to, to sign a document, just send me a PDF or a Word doc, what, what have you. Be able to go in there, identify the space, sign it with your finger on your phone, save it, and return it right there. It's just All I need fantastic. now is for that to be part of a workflow. For you to send somebody something, they click a button, it opens the app, and then they sign it. Because every, you know all the signature stuff that I deal with is all like automated process, like it's part of a business mm -hmm. process. So they need to be, you know, they're not just randomly going on their phone and clicking. Well, there's probably an it. API on the front of that. That would be nice if they added, um, you know, yeah, connect, a connector or something in Flow. That would be cool if you have any Microsoft people that are. But I, I'm still not sure how many people are on their phone when they're doing stuff like that. That's the thing. Like all the automated processes and power apps that I build, everybody says that people aren't going to be on the phone. They're just going to be on their desktops. And so I don't know if they're going to want to take that step to be like, I'll do it. On, you have to do it on your phone because there isn't a way to do it on the desktop. Unless you've got a touch screen. Yeah. yeah, right. My yeah, wife, the laptop she uh, has from school, they all get issued um, laptops that have touch screens. And she is a professor. I mean, she'll regularly mark up papers and everything with it. So I imagine that would be a natural extension to uh, – Something like that. Yeah, somebody just asked if there's a DocuSign connector. And uh, yeah, that's what I was saying. There's third party tools, DocuSign, one of the being probably. Yeah, the and Adobe eSign. Yeah. Yep. And eSign. But this one doesn't require any of those third party things. It's just built into the app. That's the right. thing. I'm not trying it out on a, on a touchpad, on uh, like an iPad or, or my Surface. Uh, so that you have, you have people in the field, and if you're able to automate, you know, could work there, but I've not, uh, I've not played with the new office app, which is what I was talking about. Um, but the, the, the OCR capability, the other thing I would say is that you, so you can two capabilities. If you're reading a magazine article and you see some graphic that has a bunch of text within it. So it's, it's an image. You can snap a picture and it'll remove the, the graphical elements and save the, the copy. Um, the other thing is that you're know, snapping a picture of that table or a graph. So you've got a table of data, uh, a bunch of numbers in it, and it will uh, recreate that. I've also done it with the bar chart. I've not tried it with the pie chart. And it goes and tries to recreate that in Excel. It, it had uh, mixed results in that, um, <laughs> but uh, definitely learning. go familiarize yourself with the product. Yeah. Gonna need a few more samples before the uh, AI's got that down, huh? Yeah. Exactly. Um, any other questions, Laura? Any other questions you've run into? Um, Common questions asked. Just in general. Yeah, Microsoft related. <laughs> <laughs> just yes, to well, keep it focused. <laughs> or algebra, you know, we went over that earlier. Right. Right. <laughs> Remedial well, never hurts. Just while I think of something, um, my husband's at the grocery store right now. And so he's like, okay, when I get back, get ready to, we're going to do our thing because, you know, so we take all the stuff that's non-perishable and we put it like away in the back of a spare room for three days and, and 
let it sit there. And then all the stuff that's perishable, we do the whole thing where you wash everything and you put it. So we're about to, he's going to be home soon. So I'm about to have to leave and go do that. But I just thought, I thought I'd let y'all know if I jump up and run, that's what I'm doing. So suddenly you know, like hose him off. Yeah. <laughs> Hazmat decon procedure. Yeah. The hazmat procedure. All right. Um, yeah, no, most of the questions that I get are um, about how to do stuff that you used to be able to do in InfoPath or with web parts and how you do them now and with the new modern stuff and with power apps. And um, yeah, I get those over and over like the repeating tables thing. Uh, how do you do repeating tables in power apps? Well, you don't do, there isn't a repeating tables button. You have to do this and this and this, and it takes like an hour to explain it. And you have to put this here and do multiple SharePoint lists. And you have to be able to know how to filter a gallery in a power app and pass the parameter and default to, you have to, so you have to know all this information about how cards work and how forms work and what a gallery is and what a, all these functions are. You have to know all that stuff before you can just that like. It takes go, longer than 30 seconds. Table. What? But that takes longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> they just want an answer like, where's the button for the repeating table? <laughs> exactly. So, and, yeah, and then I get like, um, how do you, there are no, con the connected web parts don't do what they used to do. How do you, I mean, you can do a little bit with a connected web part right now in modern. You can click on something like an item or a document and have it show that thing in the web part. That's all you can do. You can't pass parameters like this, do this complex thing like we used to do, but just all you do is you just do it as a power app instead. You just build the power app that has the galleries and the forms and the, you know, multiple galleries. You click something in one gallery and it filters the other, uh, the other gallery and uh, new behaviors. Again, you have to learn all that stuff and you have to know power apps. So, it's not just a quick answer. So that's why I teach a full advanced power apps class. That's like 12 hours long. Just do that real quick. <laughs> and then you'll be able to just know this stuff and figure it out yourself and not have to ask every single specific thing that you want to do in the instructions for that specific thing. You'll just know it. And then you'll be able to figure out how to do it. It's harder though. You know? Sadly, people are too used to just Googling it and getting an answer yeah. and you know, let me Google that for you and drop there's it a, in. There's quite a steep learning curve with power apps. Just like but the they're, development they're doing, model. They're adding some kind of customized list thing a little bit. They added the little, have you seen that appear with a little customized list form button? When you're on a form? I don't know. I have, yeah. When you're on a SharePoint list item. There's a new button <clears> at the top of the form that says customize this form. And it has just options for showing and hiding. Like it's got little check boxes next to each. Is that uh, GA and rolled out to everyone or is that early release? I, I don't know. I think I've seen that in a few different tenants um, just off the top of my head. It's not the most useful thing. So I haven't actually tried to use it or implement it. <laughs> so, but at least it's a step. I mean, I think that they said at least maybe at Ignite, they said that that one is going to be able to do a lot more. Like you're going to be able to do sort of uh customize it kind of like you can customize lists with the JSON. Maybe they said yeah. they had, they had a That's session. Jeff thinking. Keeper had a session about that at Ignite. Remember where he mm -hmm. showed that? So there's this, this is the equivalent of like you'd use with a SharePoint destroyer, customizing edit forms, new forms, that sort of stuff. Uh, all you can do is show and hide fields. Okay. There's not, there's, there's not even conditions or anything yet, but I think they said there was going to be conditional formatting, conditional something showing and hiding when they had that session, but that's not out yet, but that's going to be sort of the new way to do that stuff before you have to leap over to power app. So there's going to be more of like a baby step kind of some easy things you can do before you have to go jump off the power apps cliff, but you're, you're still going <laughs> to. Well, even the, the jump off the power apps clip, I mean, it's still, it's still more approachable than, <clears throat> excuse me, the customizable fields where people would have to learn JSON to yeah. do field formatting and all that. That It's a great technology, but that's a developer technology built by developers for developers and trying to extend it to average end users. Average end users do not speak JSON. So 
maybe this is a step in the right direction because power yeah. apps. I mean, it helps to be able to understand logic. I think people that are working in these technologies that don't understand things like the concept of conditional formatting and the concept of if then or a trigger and an action right? or how to do an outlook rule. Like people that can't grasp those kind of concepts aren't going to be able to do any of this stuff like power apps or JSON or cause it all requires an understanding of logic. Right. I think citizen developers got to be in their tool set. And then you look at the Excel spreadsheets that they use every day and you ask them about a formula in there and they're like, I don't know. Somebody just gave it to me and it works. <laughs> I've got to go yeah, do exactly. the grocery thing. I've got to Say go hi to Chris. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see you later. Bye. Hi, Laura. And, hey, Hal. Hal. and Hal steps into Laura's shoes. They look good on you, Hal. You're six inches taller. <laughs> oh, yeah. I need hair extension. I just, I need hair extension. Uh, you and me both, Hal. I hear you. <laughs> we were talking about uh, Christian and I before oh. we got on about getting some powder for the head to keep the glare down. <laughs> No, just uh, so my, yes, my son uh, I, talked about needing haircuts, and uh, I just realized that the uh, haircut place, they're still open here. That's wow. the critical service? Essential. Essential. Mm. It's right next door to the grocery store, so. Mm. <laughs> That's what I say. Roll the dice. I once had hair, but now I have glare. By what the could possibly go wrong? I can find you, mate. Yeah. That is, I like uh, uh, just to poke fun at, he'll find out. I know he'll find out, but Tom Duff, he just went and he had a haircut picture and he got it really tightly cut in the back. And, uh, and it showed a picture, he had a picture of the hair on the ground and, and I made comment about that being just from his ears. So, <laughs> uh, well, I was going to say, you, did, you had to probably magnify yeah. it to see the hair on the ground. Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's right annoying here. me to that po point where I need to, uh, I'm overdue. So I'm, I'm, it's very hippie looking. I know right now. I'm a, I apologize. Look away. I'll send you a pair of clippers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've got a few lying around. Uh, other, other questions, anything else? Somebody was asking, I saw over on the Office 365 community, somebody had asked about whether there were uh, any backup software as a service that comes with any of the um, home editions. Um, there we go. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, uh, that's painful. Yeah, this is, that's this is awesome. my buddy, Pat. I thought it was pretty funny and, and topical. That is, that is, <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, I just need to do some photoshopping and put Christian space there. You know that kind of looks like is is um, early seventies Bowie's backup bands, the Spiders from Mars. There's a couple of the guys like uh, Ronson or somebody that has that kind of poodle looking perm. I well. think it facially with the hair it made made me initially think of Getty Lee from Rush. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, oh, that was fun. Thank you. So your backup question. What was yeah, that? So I was asking if there's anything I'm uh, moving over to that page now to look at the question, but I, th I believe it was, is there anything that is offered as part of the just office 365 um, home, you know, editions or. Well, know? yeah, well, Microsoft uh, backs the data up on regular intervals. I believe they consume DPM internally because there's their SLAs and their, RPOs and RTOs, if you're getting into too many TLAs, um, align with VSS-based snapshots, volume shadow copy service, and that's how DPM works. Now, the, the fact that Microsoft protects the data, I, I get this question a lot, and I want to be clear because people have sworn that they've seen um, numbers for this stuff and it's been backed up by Microsoft. I've done a lot of work in disaster recovery and everybody wants to know what Microsoft's RTO and RPO intervals are for backups. Those are recovery point objectives, recovery time objectives. Basically how much of your data is protected backward looking and then how long does it take to get your data back? People have 
throw numbers around, but I don't think if you go out to Microsoft's site, you're going to find any specific numbers stated. The only numbers I've ever found specifically stated are for those folks who had um, uh, dedicated hosting, because that, that involves a different arrangement. We're all shared in the Office 365 world where you, know, you and 200 of your closest friends are in the same tenant. Microsoft, I think at this point, depending on the service, you know, the data will be backed up, but to get it back, and I'm thinking of SharePoint here in particular, I've seen Windows anywhere from uh, 12, it, I think we're hovering around 12 hours, maybe down to four hours uh, on average or typically. Going back, data loss, I've seen everything, but I have no idea how much of your data is actually protected and how recently you may have made changes that are protected. So that varies, but those sorts of numbers are the ones that keep uh, DR architects up at night. And that's one of the reasons why uh, most folks doing DR plans who have strict RPO, RTO time intervals hesitate when it comes to cloud services. Because if you can't get those numbers down, if they don't align with your internal organizational metrics and what you are guaranteeing your users, there's a lot of problem that can come out of that. So um, there are plenty of third party products around backup and recovery. Uh, what they essentially do is use uh, many of the um, same mechanisms that are used for migration, the migration APIs to get data uh, in and out of uh, the various services like SharePoint Online. Uh, I know I, you go out and type SharePoint Online backup, you'll get a whole host of ad hits and things like that. So there's plenty of third party stuff. Microsoft does their own, but you have to make special requests if you want to, for instance, if I wiped out a site collection, I'll have to get that back. In the absence of wiping out something that, that on that level, a site collection, Remember, you've always got your recycle bin. It's a two-stage recycle bin. If a user deletes something, it goes to the second stage. Until an admin deletes it out of the second stage or it lapses due to a time period interval, uh, which are configurable, it won't be gone forever. So if something's out of your first stage recycle bin, talk to your admin. They can get out of the second stage recycle bin. And that's for things like list items and pages and whatnot. Right. Yeah, there's, um, and of course, it, it, if you're talking about uh, Microsoft Teams, and there's two components, there's the SharePoint component and having a strategy for that content. And the other side of that is the exchange workload, so all the conversations. And so typically, organizations have uh, more mature offerings built around their exchange uh, solutions. So you might already have something in place. Uh, obviously, if it's for, for at home, I mean, you're going to have those same limitations. I'm not sure of anything that's at that smaller end product-wise that is able to go give you more of a granular backup than what you get out of the box um, through uh, Office 365. But for a small to mid mid-sized business up to enterprise, um, there are, just like with SharePoint, there are backup solutions that will give you that, those more granular controls uh, for the exchange side as well. So something to think about. Um, another question I saw posted is, uh, are there any alternatives for Office 365 service health? health? And I, so I know that, um, uh, so he, he commented, this is uh, from Samir, this is the, the only one I found is down detector. Um, and he's looking for something what, you know, more broadly, preferably would, would be to see in, in the whole of Europe. So looking. Interesting. Yeah, because I've had this conversation. Uh, I was talking with um, Tony Francola over at uh, Syskit, because Syskit makes a ton of, uh, uh, they started with the on-prem market, and they've got wonderful tools for uh, monitoring metrics, performance, um, various services. And I was talking to him because they, one of the things, they're, they're working to evolve their cloud product line. And he's like, what is the greatest problem or what is the greatest need users have? And I said, well, from my perspective, it's the ability to, at a glance, see what services are up that I use and which ones are down. Because if you think about it, the average end user in Office 365, if a service is down, they don't have access to the admin dashboard and the tenant. You know, what they're gonna, it's gonna manifest for them, for instance, if I've got Outlook up, I'm suddenly going to be unable to get my mail. I'm going to try to sync. 
I'm going to get an error. And oftentimes, unfortunately for us, it, this manifests as, you know, you can't get in and so you're reprompted. And so the first thought users have is, I need to change my password or I've been locked out of my account. And so they go out and initiate that process and it may be authentication related. And so they actually get into this very inconsistent, indeterminate state when it really was just a problem with Exchange or Office 365 sign-on. If there's any way for users to see that, that would be a very wonderful thing to just go out and check this dashboard or better have it pushed to some of the Office 365 products that I'm running on my desktop, like Office Suite. So I said, you know, I told Tony it would be wonderful if SysKit could bring something like that to the market. And he, <laughs> the email I got back was kind of like, uh, that we'd be biting off quite a bit there, or it would be, you know, a lot of stuff to, um, we'd have to go through a lot of APIs, and, which I understand entirely, which is probably why this isn't automatically out there. So I know Microsoft has been improving the, uh, the metric services and APIs that you can use to gather this data on your own. So we have APIs, developers have APIs that they can pull this stuff out of Office 365, but if there was some way to get real-time service data and see that posted in Office apps and things like that, that would save an awful lot of problem, a lot of, an awful lot of angst on the part of users, and it would save admins a lot of support calls that they really can't do anything with. Boy, I'm diatribing heavy today. Oh, you were just doing great. We're just letting you roll. <laughs> yeah. Great information. So <sighs> finally, Sean provides some value here. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, there, yeah, I just can't that. be the eye candy all the time. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> or any of the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, so Naveen has kind of a part two, uh, Sean, of the question about uh, the recycle bin. He said, I question here is, is how to increase the number of days of the recycle bin um, the, the second stage will retain content in SharePoint online that's a good question I believe you can uh, configure that through the uh, SharePoint tenant admin actually let me go out and confirm that and we can come back to that traditionally it was uh, something you could do within central admin on-prem which the closest extension to that in SharePoint Online, of course, is going to be uh, tenant administration for SharePoint. So I'm going out to my Bitstream Foundry tenant right now. You're looking that up. Hey, Greg, in, so with your new role and everything, uh, you know, are you seeing uh, you know, any kind of patterns in the questions uh, within your organization? So, you know, not, not everyone's aware of my new role. So let me change my background to be more brand there you appropriate. Go. There you go. Um, <laughs> I just switched over to be the web systems manager at Sundance. And uh, we're still very early in our digital transformation. So we've got a lot of work to do there. So the, the questions, you know, are... Wait, let's really, just clarify. Greg is just whining and dining with, with on the red carpet or... or, or uh, Red carpet adjacent. It's the Red Ford carpet. <laughs> red carpet adjacent. Mm, that's interesting. So, you know, there's still a lot that, uh, you know, we're working towards. Um, you know, our exchange servers are still on-prem. So, that, you know, we started to have some discussions around how that'll switch. And, you know, one of the interesting things is being in this retail market, it's kind of a, a newer excuse of, being able to shove costs forward and backwards on, you know, quarterly results and other things um, has a lot of advantages that they are hesitant to give up, you know, despite all of the clear benefits of, you know, moving those off-prem and uh, into the cloud. So one of the reasons I'm there, I think, I hope, is uh, to help facilitate some of that uh, transformation and, uh, you know, the silver lining to the dark cloud is the state of the world is really forcing a lot of things to happen a lot more quickly for companies, not just Sundance, to uh, digitally transform themselves. 
And so a lot of people are suddenly scrambling to say, you know, where are our capabilities? Like, how good is this? Like we talked about this from maybe a DR perspective, like, you know, Sean was bringing up, but maybe this is, you know, just brought more broadly business continuity and, you know, what would happen if, you know, suddenly half our workforce disappeared or, you know, no one could come into the office, um, you know, and whether that's like here in Utah, we've had a series of smallish, you know, but large enough to feel earthquakes that, you know, had a lot of people really nervous as well, you know, and so the building I used to work in was very old. It had been marked as like architecturally whatever something. And so they're unable to touch the building in really meaningful ways on the outside anyway. And so inside they had like this weird mesh stuff they'd glued to walls. So bricks wouldn't come loose and hit people and other things. And is that you know, part of that like late 1970s architecturally, whatever design to just glue stuff to the wall? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So, you know, but I, you know, businesses would look at things like that and kind of assess their risk. And that was, you know, a lot of those physical concerns and, you know, it was great that they were addressed, you know, that's important too, but you look at the digital needs that companies have today and how many people are still inefficient at, you know, collaborating or, you know, working together in a, a purely digital world. And even like just meetings like we're having right now, like how inefficient they are and people don't quite understand how to make it all work. And as soon as you get, you know, more than I'm going to say five people, cause we've got, you know, five panelists sort of, we've got half of Lara, she's off, you know, hosing down the family, but uh, Sink it, down. people just don't know how to like raise their hand and they sit there and they wait and you know, Hal's really excited to jump in here, but uh, his connections kind of janky. <laughs> Greg, I believe the kids say cranked. Cranked. Not okay. Janky. It's like, Very cranked. good. Yeah. So I appreciate you keeping me up on my pop culture references as well. There you go. This is why we're awkward friends. <laughs> Many more reasons why we're awkward friends, Greg. Many more. We'll just add it to the list. That <laughs> that burning tire fire. <laughs> uh, good times. Good times. Yeah. All right, Sean. Any any? Were you able to find anything on that other question? I'm actually digging. You keep staying. You know what? I did want to bring up one thing related to that. And uh, this is just from past experience that, uh, you know, especially SharePoint using it as a document repository, whether that's OneDrive for Business or SharePoint proper. Um, by default, document versioning is turned on, but it's a relatively lowish number, like 50 to 100 revisions. And especially when you have autosave turned on and it's cranking through those revisions pretty quickly. I've seen a lot of people get bit. They're like, well, there was this version I was working on last week. You know, that's not that long ago. How come it doesn't have the version from last week? And it's like, because you're already on version 2000 and you know, whatever, like, yeah, that thing rolled through a long time ago. And uh, you know, the thing that I wish there is a lot of backup software would often say, Hey, you know, I'm going to take backups every increment, you know, like hourly or five, five minutes or whatever, but then I'm going to keep one that is an hour old, a day old, a week old, a month old, a year old. And so you can always roll back to those kind of known points. I kind of wish there was something similar in the SharePoint versioning, whereas it, you know, would purge those older versions. It wasn't just marching forward. It would say, Hey, I'm going to keep something from a day ago or every day. I'm going to keep one backup, you know, even though I'm deleting all these interim versions in between or, you know, maybe make that configurable or something. I don't know. We start to get down the rabbit hole of, you know, you're going to customize it one way and that's going to be wrong for somebody or it's going to be set that way and they expect it another. And I get it. There's challenges, but, you know, it's one of those wish list items like, hey, this would actually be really helpful and solve some, you know, real world problems and, yeah, you know, maybe it's not ideal, but it's better than what we have. And so, hey, let's let's work towards that. Yeah, the uh, I can tell you why that is, um, or why you are going to have trouble getting that is because of shredded storage these days. Yeah, that's um, true. Because versioning, of course, when we store a version of a, a document, we're actually, as you create a new version, you're only creating, you're creating delta. a new version, but it's a delta. Yeah, exactly. And so without the intervening deltas, it's hard to get back to that version because whenever you restore from 10 days ago or 10 versions ago, you've got to reapply 
every previous version on yeah. top of and to get back to that state. So, yeah. And it's modestly uh, complex to say, hey, I want to delete these five interim versions. I yeah. got to go and create new blobs. You got to write those out to storage. Yeah. It's a little bit of a mess. You've got a question over here. Sorry, I missed it. Uh, so, Wasif was saying that he has an issue uh, with his email. It says any email from outside with an attachment, he can't open any of the attachments and is telling him access denied. Any attachments? Yeah. There are a bunch of attachments that Outlook will not open simply because they've got uh, malware associated possibilities with them. But uh, yeah, that's even that's generally will notify you. It'll tell yeah. you malware uh, you know is identified yeah. versus you know yeah. Uh, you need to have the uh, a register something registered for that MIME type to be able to open it as well effectively open it but that wouldn't block you i think from windows trying to open it and say what app do you want to use for this yeah always is saying the pdfs is what what stuff is that you know, any content type or is it just pdfs yeah and is it outlook that's popping this message up or something else popping the message up yeah well, it uses the same infrastructure, but I'd be curious, like if you save it from Outlook and upload it to OneDrive or SharePoint, you know, does it behave a little bit differently? Um, I'd also, just from a troubleshooting perspective, say, hey, go use an incognito browser or another computer, make sure there's not something goofy with like your cookies. Um, and then also, you know, checking other users, like did something somehow get configured in your preferences somewhere that is different than what the standard is? Yeah, yeah and a good question. That was that I would do the exact same thing, which is go into the browser version of that, try that first, because it that'll identify if it's something that is at the uh, you know the the user level, the identity level versus uh, right something Local wrong system. with the integration of the, your desktop application. Yeah, so if we confirms he's trying to open this in the Outlook client. Don't see a re response yet. Well, and even in the Outlook client, like by default, when you click on a PDF, it just shows in the preview pane and says, hey, there's no previewer installed. You know, you need to double click on that attachment to spawn your associated, you know, PDF viewer, which, you know, might be your, one of your modern browsers or Acrobat or whatever application you have installed. But I think the only previewers that are really installed are either for images or office documents, right? But those are the only ones that default. Remember, a hundred years ago, it probably wasn't that long. Let's be honest, but close. Um, I uh, I built an Office add-in to preview XML files and just you know use the IE engine, just fed the XML there because it would format it. Um, it was pretty trivial. I mean, it was like less than a hundred lines of code, but at the same time, it's kind of like, why why do uh, I need to do this? And the pain you inflicted. And the pain, so, yep. so, so I get a little clarification says that he's talking about PDFs. He can see in a preview, but he can't open Acrobat uh, DC. And it may be that your uh, license for uh, Acrobat has expired. So if you have that file type associated with an app with the Adobe uh, Acrobat no longer have the license uh, enabled, you won't be able to open it through that. You should be able to still open any uh, PDF regardless of having a license with Adobe, but it has a, it has that weird little period where it's got it still associated with that application. But that might be the why you're, you're yeah. getting that specific error. I've had that. And well, it, I think Acrobat's delivered through the creative suite now too, right? So if it can't talk to their servers and can't auth or something, you may see weirdness too. Yeah. Well, I just mm -hmm. had this where I, uh, yeah, where it, it was my reminder that my license had expired. And so I had to go in and renew that for the creative suite. Um, uh, but I was experiencing that same thing, but it was, I was able to um, save the file and open it up uh, on the desktop. Um, and uh, so, cause you don't need to have Acrobat to open that or you use the, the, the free version of, of Acrobat. There's just the reader without the full capability. Yeah. So probably as, saving that, 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 that uh, file locally. Save it locally. Yeah. And then try and uh, open it from your desktop because that'll go direct to Acrobat and any dialogues that might be getting eaten by the, um, 
uh, office, uh, remote invocation. Those sometimes you get dialogues that are lost in the process. You'll see it quite clearly, and hopefully that'll give you better troubleshooting measures. Yeah, and how to resolve that. Bo brings up a great point, and I've experienced this too. He says, I've also noticed that Outlook's temporary folder gets full, which would prevent opening up attachments because it oh, could be yeah. a so That could be another problem. Gets Check full. your disk space. Yeah. Wow, if somebody's running yeah, out of the happens. system drive space. Uh, Has it happened in a while? Uh, that's a scary situation. Well, that's the least of your concerns. Your attachments <laughs> are the least of your concerns if you're running out of system drive space. And this is the symptom here. That there's an underlying problem that's much bigger. Yeah. You're heading towards the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah, well, I need to drop off because I've got a, uh, a 10 o'clock I need to hop on and I uh, need a couple minutes to prepare. But uh, it's always fun to see my friends out in the community. You know, thank you guys for joining Christians, for setting this up. It's great. Great questions. Great discussion today. This was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, Greg. Yep. Talk to you all later. Take care, Greg. Yep. Yeah. Bye, Greg. Yeah. Time flies. And then there were three. And then there were three. Exactly how. Yeah. Well, Greg, you know, I just had, sorry, he's gone, so I'll beat up on him a little bit more. But yeah, he <laughs> apparently a new job and being the president of two separate user groups was just too much pressure for him. He just couldn't uh, take it on. I can't so. understand why. He does a tremendous amount for the community here, uh, here in Utah. So, um, but uh, anyway, yeah. And then somebody's asking about uh, changing teams' backgrounds. Not gonna, uh, yeah. It's you could only blur. Not yet. So. Well, there's a there's like I a think chroma that's key. about a month away, something like yeah. that, but it's coming. Third party, yeah. I know that I, I've heard it's it's imminent. Now, it might fall in priority behind things like keeping the platform running and uh, <laughs> dealing with the crushing <laughs> weight of the 700. <laughs> you know, but I don't know. They, they, uh, if Microsoft uh, has their head on straight, then they'll handle this background thing <laughs> first. <laughs> uh, well, they went to the extent of showing it off quite a bit during, uh, during the MVP summit. And a number of the uh, product group interactions and so forth I've been to since then, uh, every, all of the Microsoft people, the presenters are using it. So, and everybody's asking, well, how did you do that? And the snap the camera well. filters are, are pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Everybody's got a new toy. Yeah. It's a um, new fun thing. Well, it's, uh, I did like, uh, I'm sure like a lot of us that I downloaded that thing. I've not gone in and played it. I've not actually turned it on. Uh, yeah, so. so you're saying point. there's, you have competing priorities, Christian? Yeah, just uh, something else came up. I don't know. My you know, son came home after a year and a half of living in Argentina. Little things, you know. Ah, he'll still Definitely. be there in two weeks. I know. Well, yes, he will be in two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks in a day, he'll be gone. But, yeah. Uh, all right. Any final questions? We've got a couple more minutes here. Uh, anybody from the anybody that's watching? We've got uh, about twenty people that are in watching the the live stream. Uh, actually, there's two different feeds. Um, so you've got about you know twenty and one, another seventeen, eighteen, and another one. Um, if there are any questions, post them. And then, of course, we'll be back this evening. So this is our. Uh, you know, America's and EMEA time will be back at 6 p.m. Pacific uh, for our APAC uh, schedule. And uh, make it if you can. If you've got questions, of course, you can always post questions out to the Office 365 community in Facebook. I guess I could look at the camera. That's what I'm talking. Um, you can post them out on Facebook to the Office 365 community, and we'll be going through and monitoring that. You can always reach out to any of us we're all approachable. You know, you can find us on the interwebs. Absolutely. Uh, um, I don't think I verbally addressed it. Uh, the, oh, yes, that's the true. The recycle bin settings in SharePoint Online. I posted a link in the chat window. It appears that you cannot configure those in SharePoint Online, and that makes sense because second stage recycle bin settings are configured at the web app level. And... The web application level in SharePoint Online is shared amongst all tenants, so that would pose a problem. And 
Yeah, I'm, I'm posting over to that thread um, now. Come on, let me put it, paste okay. it, we go. But in uh, SharePoint on-prem, you would go, an admin would go out to central admin, pull up the web application, go to general settings, and that's where you configure the recycled in settings. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, gentlemen, and to Greg and Laura for joining as well. And uh, I tried to um, I tried to peer pressure uh, Andrew Connell into joining. He was having none of that. Um, <laughs> Oh, she's hey, back from that. Decon. Cool. Thanks. All right. Bye. So, wait, so you, you have to you have to enter with your hands up that you've like been sanitized that you're still in scrubs and <laughs> level A hazmat suit. If I left the camera on, you would have seen me walking by with bags of groceries that are going into the quarantine area. <laughs> That's yeah. nice. Or into your hoarding bedroom. <laughs> Uh, I still really like this. A Microsoft person who uh, during the MVP summit. Um, had a background of like a hazmat tent and I'm just like yeah it wasn't a pro it was I laughed out loud I literally lol'd uh, when I saw that and I thought it's like it was a bit strong of a visual uh, for a background <laughs> that's awesome it's very funny but I think on Fox News the other day who had his background it was like he was in a bunker it had like a metal bed and like an old <laughs> timey kind of computer like console looking thing and some anyway Jeez. yeah good times good times well uh thanks everybody for joining we're we're going to uh wrap this up now and we'll be back in a few hours in specifically yep. eight hours eight for, hours uh, asia pacific time frame office hours so if you've got any questions and and any of the panelists would like to join us feel free not like you guys are going anywhere <laughs> when you put it that way Christian over me. I need questions I have questions about how to get rid of it because I've been you know we've been going out doing outdoorsy things more yeah Good. what are you trying to get rid of Laura poison ivy I know I hear the double or nothing strategy is gasoline so it's an oil you know like dissolves alike so gasoline oh. is very nonpolar in terms of solvents but then you risk the BTEX I was saving my, that was my technical timing. question to ask in the next session. I'm just All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will answer uh, chemistry questions as well. So. That's right. I, I live in the West. We don't have that poison ivy stuff out here. So. Or chemistry. Or that. That's right. Oh, well, we got, we got things like scorpions and centipedes. Rattlesnakes. And that kind of stuff. And whatever. You keep them out. Yeah. All you do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks a lot for joining, and we'll uh, we'll see everybody online soon because we're not doing Hi. anything else. See you guys yep. later. All right. Talk yep. to you later. Bye. Bye.